Now this year, I'm loving someone who deserves me. Me. While the countless story arcs of Orange is the New Black may have seemed to ramble or digress at times over the years, in the show's final season, each character arrives at a neat resolution, shedding light on what her arc has really been all about. Before, my life was... And now my life... is the mayor. If you look closer, the series uses each person's ending to encapsulate a distinct message or central theme of the show. Come see my room. It's a celebration of maximalism. Oh my. So in the third video of our series on how Orange is the New Black ended, we're looking at the deeper meaning in the conclusions of Red, Nikki, Suzanne, and Alex. Here's our take. You really have to think of your time here as a mandala. You're watching The Take. Thanks for watching and be sure to share and subscribe. This video is brought to you by Skillshare, an online learning community where millions of people come together to take classes that fuel their creative journey. If you're one of the first 1,000 people to click the link in the description below, you'll get two free months of Skillshare Premium. So join today and start exploring your creativity. Red's ending illustrates the dangers of anger, as well as the perils of aging without a safety net. On one level, Red's story is a cautionary tale about hanging on to rage. Stop hitting walls and plot your revenge. Matching the trademark hair color that spawned her nickname, Galena Red Reznikov is a fiery person full of tough spirit. The second you are perceived as weak, you already are. The series immediately introduces her as a powerhouse who rules the prison kitchen and reigns as the proud mother of her prison family. Thank you, Mommy. In light of this vibrant portrait of strength, it's particularly heartbreaking when this character who once seemed unbreakable is diagnosed with early-onset dementia in the final season. I can't say how quickly, but eventually you'll need assistance with all the activities of daily Yet if we look closer, Red's decline has been a longer, more gradual story. As we get to know this dynamo over the years, we observe that her inner fire, in addition to making her ferociously loving, also leads her to cling to anger. You called my food disgusting. You're getting starved to death! Which, over time, corrodes her from the inside. So they can put me on a leash and feed me for two for the rest of my life. They can drag me out of this kitchen when I die. And the painful fate that befalls her is, at least in part, caused by her inability to let go of all this rage. A big trigger of Red's mental deterioration is the unthinkable torture inflicted on her and her family by sadistic rogue CO Desi Piscatella. But Piscatella only gets into Litchfield during the riot because Red lets him in, hoping to get revenge. Oh, did mommy not tell you about her secret plan? You were gonna catfish me into a mouse trap, and then what? Stab me to death with your sharp Russian wit? Her long isolation in Shu then causes irrevocable damage to her long-term health. But she's placed there because she attacks Frida in a fury over her friend's betrayal. Look me in the eye, coward! Back off! You were my friend! How could you? As admirable as it is that Red values loyalty and honesty above all and holds herself to a high standard in relationships, It's about character. It's about who shows up for you and who you show up for. Her inability to overcome passionate grudges and disappointments causes her to suffer more than any of the people she vows to punish. You're off to the shoe. Looks like you ruined things all on your own. I trusted you, Frida, and you threw me to the walls like a bag of old feet. Because she won't curb her emotional reaction toward Frida, she misses the opportunity to meet her grandchildren for the first time. So her hot-headed impulsivity directly harms her long-term happiness. How can I sleep knowing Frida's in Florida living the life of Riley while I'm stuck in this cesspool, missing all the good years with my grandchildren? Just as Red won't let go of past events, her past won't let go of her. As the series ends, she desperately attempts to obtain forgiveness from the mother of a young man whose death she unintentionally caused long ago. Galina, огромное тебе спасибо за совет. Илюша уж был настоящим маменьким сыночком. 
нам он не пригодился. But when the mother denies her disgrace, adding insult to injury, Red's told that she's already received this rejection. She said that you already sent her that same letter 10 years ago, the same apology. She said she didn't forgive you then, and she isn't ready to forgive you now. And we can only assume her ailing mind will drive her to repeat this humiliating emotional distress again. I, I, I never sent her a letter. See, I, I think that you know, maybe it did, and you know, just forgot. It's a fate that captures Red's essential problem. When you refuse to give up past hurts and grievances, you're sentenced to relive that pain over and over. Even if she won't forgive, though, time will force her to forget. And Red's forgetting creates a personal hell for her in the form of Frida. Galina Reslakov. And you are? Uh, Berlin. Frida Berlin. Nice to meet you, Frida Berlin. Red is doomed to live beside this woman she's forgotten she hates, only to intermittently remember long enough to be tortured by the knowledge that her burning desire for revenge is forever thwarted. I remember the poorly I'm gonna wait it out till you lose your mind again. And then maybe we'll play a few hands of gin. I'll kill you! In addition to teaching these lessons about anger, Red's bleak ending is a devastating portrait of how the tragedy of aging is exacerbated by destructive, callous institutions. Red's diagnosis is all the more sad because it could have been avoided. The prison is directly responsible for triggering and accelerating her health issues through locking her up in SHU. The rapid progression was probably caused by an acute case of delirium that began while you were isolated in the segregated housing unit. It also rewarded and tolerated the dangerous Piscatella. Red's story illustrates how environments like Litchfield not only don't provide for the special needs of old age, but even actively damage elderly people and worsen their problems. This is a very relevant observation given that the elderly population in prisons is rapidly growing, and now higher than ever, with close to 200,000 people in American prisons aged 55 and older. For as long as we've known her, Red's personality has been synonymous with the iconic shade of her locks. It's Red. But as she stops dyeing her hair and lets it go gray, this visually reflects her fading health and mind, and signals even that she's becoming less herself. The Red we first got to know was impossible to defeat, the leader who mothered and took care of those weaker than her. You gotta hit rock bottom before you know which direction to go in. In most stories, this character would inevitably triumph over anything you threw at her. So the unremitting misery of her ending, the fact that she can't get back up again, sends a clear message about how impossible it is to overcome a world that's fully stacked against you. Happily Ever After was invented for the storybooks, so kids reach breathing age without killing themselves. As Red ceases to feel like herself, the one silver lining is that someone else becomes the new Red at Litchfield. Nikki Nichols' ending is about paying forward the kindness you've benefited from. As the series wraps up, Nikki's longtime prison family unravels. The band is broken up. Feeling guilty that she failed to read the signs of Red's and Lorna's worsening mental illness earlier. So don't take this the wrong way, but you've been with her this entire time, and you didn't know. Nikki scrambles in vain to keep the family together, even neglecting Shani, the new woman she's fallen for, and failing to say goodbye before she's deported. Her belief that she's let her loved ones down calls back to season four, when Red learns that Nikki has relapsed into drug use and blames herself for not noticing sooner. I failed you. But in this case, there's nothing Nikki could have done to change Red's outcome. And likewise, even if she could keep Lorna in D-block with her like she tries to, it wouldn't be enough to give her friend what she needs. She needs more help than you or me can give her. So in the end, Nikki takes Red's place as the new prison mother to other inmates, a succession that's visually signaled through her sporting Red's signature bold red lipstick and nail polish. From her surrogate mom, Red, Hi, Mom. I need to talk to you about something important. Who shepherded her through the darkest times in her addiction, Nikki learned what supportive parenting looks like. No, I was gonna get you some mouthwash. A clean mouth makes you feel better. When Red gave her prison daughter permission to incriminate her to the federal agents in order for Nikki to avoid a long sentence, 
she showed what it means to be a true mother, a far cry from the narcissistic, neglectful parents Nikki was born with. You go straight to your father's house. No, no, I'm not taking her. Oh, of course, so I'm stuck with her? What else is new? I don't want her. So thanks to what she's learned from her mom about providing active love, Nikki is equipped to pass on that nurture to others who can use her help. She employs recovering addicts in her kitchen, offering the support she once badly needed. Day three of detox is rough. Here's a bucket. Just get it out. We'll keep going. Thus, she exemplifies the lesson that, while we may badly desire to pay back the kindnesses we've received, more often, life offers us the opportunity to pay them forward. And in this, we find true satisfaction and self-actualization. You're gonna be okay. Suzanne Warren's story illustrates the power of embracing your own unique perspective. She begins the series dubbed Crazy Eyes by her fellow inmates, and is introduced to us through white middle-class Piper's eyes as a scary threat. This is my wife here, so you need to step. I will cut you! Underlining how people with mental health issues, especially people of color, are frequently misjudged to be violent or frightening. Her name is Crazy Eyes, and she follows me everywhere. That really happened? Jeez. What kind of crazy? They're just crazy. They're just full of crazy. It's terrifying. But over the course of the series, Suzanne repeatedly disproves the false and reductive assumptions others make about her, and she gradually empowers herself by expanding the scope of her understanding. You know, it turns out I'm a fixer, like Olivia Pope. Early in the series, her mood instability, impulsivity, and difficulties reading social cues make it hard for her to form stable relationships and vulnerable to manipulation. V says I did it. V is a liar. <laughs> no, 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 no. She is a truth teller. She told me that. Though this Shakespeare quoting erotica writer clearly possesses high intelligence, whose loves I prize as the dead carcasses of unburied men that do corrupt my air. She has a child's emotional maturity and grasp of how the world at large works. Because sometimes people just don't want to play with you, and that's okay. Actress Uzu Aduba has said that the stage directions described her character as innocent like a child. And while she remains an innocent at heart, her story in Orange is the New Black is one of growing up. I'm growing up. It's hard. But it's happening. She develops emotional maturity through forming healthy relationships with people who get her and appreciate her for who she is. Even though she never really gets the level of professional help she needs, thanks in large part to the support of these caring individuals, she develops her self-understanding and her ability to socially engage. Thank you. I'm always trying to make things better. I got a lot to learn from you. Her deeper nature as a fiercely protective person who wants more than anything to be loved gets to be expressed positively, and she increasingly finds her voice through creative outlets like writing. This is like Christmas gifts and hide and seek and cooking souffles and bathroom stalls, no peeking. In the final season, when she faces the truth she's repressed that Tasty has been wrongfully convicted, Suzanne takes a big step forward in acknowledging that the world can be wrong. Tasty. Didn't kill anyone, right? But the court says that she's a murderer. This revelation unbalances her, since, like a child, she's dependent on the comfort of believing that the world is as it ought to be. The court system actually made a mistake. Big what? The court system always makes mistakes. <laughs> oh, yuck. As she opens up to this more adult-like view of the flawed world as it is, eventually Suzanne even comes to the revelation that she doesn't deserve to be in Litchfield. I deserve to be her. I heard a boy. Dylan. Wait, you're, you're crazy. I'm special brain, whatever. Because her mental condition prevented her from knowing she was committing a crime. Do I deserve to be here? You deserve to be in a facility that can help you with your cognitive difference. But I'm not, Mom. I'm here. And the final season sees her analyzing the social dynamics of the prison's chicken coop as a microcosm of her social environment, interpreting the chicken's behavior as an analogy for debates about how to treat inmates. I isolated the offender away from the other chickens. You put the chicken in the shoe? The shoe 
has a negative connotation. Her painful progress toward grasping complex problems and injustice underlines the importance of looking directly and honestly at dysfunction in the world, even though this is difficult for all of us to do. Peetuck hated chicken too. Thought it was cruel and I think she might be right. By the end, Suzanne comes to own the differentness of her special brain and inspires others to do the same. You're not dumb. She's got a special brain, like me. In many ways, Suzanne is the soul of Orange is the New Black. There is a long history in this country of pudding taking, and it divides along chocolate and vanilla lines. Also, butterscotch. That's the natives. The show is full of admiration for her sensitive, funny, loving outlook toward the world, expressed through her one-of-a-kind mind. When I look into their chicken faces, I just understand them. I think it's because I think of them as people. The writing takes pains to point out how poorly our system takes care of pure, vulnerable people like her, repeatedly highlighting the prison industrial complex's failure to properly treat mental illness. Tell her you need your medication. No, oh, I need my medication! But ultimately, the show uses Suzanne's journey as inspiration to remind us that understanding empowers and accepting what's unique about us is a superpower. What is it you really want? Ice cream. And justice. Alex Vaz comes to represent the inability to escape your past. It didn't matter what choices we made. We would have ended up right here on this bed. For much of the show, Alex tries unsuccessfully to get free from her previous life working for an international drug cartel. I wish I could do this all over again, but I can't. When she manages to get released from prison, she's consumed with the fear that she'll be killed by her former kingpin as punishment for testifying against him. I'm skipping town. You can't. I don't have a choice. These people know where I live. And she quickly ends up back in prison for violating her probation. While her paranoia later reaches such heights that she seems to be losing her sanity. You stop making light of this. There is a very real possibility that he would send someone for me. Her fears are justified when a guard attempts to murder her. You don't have to do this. Yeah, I do. For most of her time behind bars, and especially near the end of the show when she hopes to join her wife Piper on the outside, Alex is determined to keep a low profile and not add any more time to her sentence. But she's unable to distance herself from the person she used to be. Her natural talent for criminal activity gets noticed, and she's forced to sell contraband by multiple guards. I am not your Maria full of grace. I know what happens if that opens up in my stomach. I die. I'm one of the good ones. This is all new to me. Not anymore. You're forcing me to sell drugs for you. Meanwhile, from the very start of the series, Alex must confront her personal past when her former lover, Piper, arrives at Litchfield. As the series goes on, all the events in Alex's and Piper's past continue to resurface and haunt their relationship. Look at what we're doing, it's not working. Fighting, cheating, and negotiating. Haven't we always? Yes. After Piper learns Alex named her as an accomplice, landing her in jail. She's the whole reason you're in there. How does it feel to be in love with the woman who ruined our lives? This betrayal leads to resentment and revenge, creating more wounds. I'm really f***ing angry because I love you, Alex. I love you and I f***ing hate you. Meanwhile, the reason Alex implicated Piper was already partly as payback for her ex leaving her when she was emotionally distraught over her mom's death. Much later in their relationship, again, Alex fears that Piper will bail when it's no longer convenient, leading her to act out in destructive ways. Because her life is out there now, and I was scared that you would leave me. The affair she starts with her CO, McCullough, repeats a toxic past pattern too, as we find out that Alex had another girlfriend when she first began seeing Piper. This is what you do. You are so afraid of losing control that you just blow shit up before anyone can hurt you. Eventually, Alex tries to release Piper from their unofficial marriage, feeling that these unhealthy cycles can't be overcome. Pipes, there's just been too much 
bad shit. But in the end, Alex finds silver linings in her inability to leave history behind her. When she's transferred to a maximum security prison in Ohio, she happily reunites with former friends from Litchfield. So this time, we see her reconnecting with her past in a positive light. Hey Jones, what does Judy King look like naked? And Piper makes the decision to stand by her wife, even though it's messy and hard, vowing that they'll give themselves a fresh start. And a clean slate. So ultimately, the solution to Alex's personal hell of being trapped by a dysfunctional past is to stop resisting this. I just want you to know how sorry I am for the up detour you took with me. You're not a detour from my life. You are my life. You can find peace by accepting what's behind you, embracing the chaotic person you still are, and not expecting more of yourself than slow, steady progress. Look, life gets messy sometimes. You, know, you gotta learn, you can't always fix it. Watch out for our next Orange is the New Black video on how the remaining characters ended. You'll be back. Humans and narrative junkies. If you're new here, be sure to subscribe and hit the bell to be notified about all of our new videos. This video is brought to you by Skillshare, an online learning community that offers affordable classes designed to fit your schedule and your skill level. Skillshare is a great antidote to anxiety and boredom. Their classes on coding, graphic design, and much more will immerse you in a new creative world. One Skillshare original you can check out right now is Aaron Draplin's class on how to design great merch. If you've always been curious about creating your own pins, hats, or t-shirts, his class is great for learners of all levels. Right now, Skillshare is offering our viewers two months access to all their classes for free. But that's only if you're one of the first 1,000 people to click the link in the description below. So join today and jumpstart your creative journey.